Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the June 2024 Care Coordination Info Share. We are kicking off this um, session with a special topic, and that includes regulatory documentation requirements. Why is this coming up? We are finding that there have been just a lot of questions about documentation, what is needed to document a service, either as a service provider or a care coordinator, and the components of a sufficient uh, documentation, either a note uh, for a contact to service delivery. And just so that you're all aware, we do have a training in our academy on the basics. But Kara, was there anything that you kind of wanted to dig into a little bit deeper on that topic today? Anything that we should be pulling up or checking out? Um, for documentation, you know, we, we do get quite a few questions from all angles around it. Um, I always end up, you know, like you said, I think it's a good resource to for anybody, not just our care coordinator community, but our provider community, they can go ahead and take the training within our um, our learning management system, SDS Academy. And uh, there's quite a bit of explanation in there um, and some documents that they can review. So if you are working with, if your work, the care coordinator is working with a provider and you think they're having trouble with documentation um, you can always refer them to training. You can talk about the website. Uh, a lot of times this comes up in context of like, you know, trying to do a renewal plan and trying to look at um, maybe requesting more services or different, you know, something like that. And reviewing documentation of services given is part of that. Uh, we've definitely had questions around, you know, care coordinators having access to that kind of documentation. And you definitely can. I mean, the person should should know about that and authorize it. And, you know, I get the question about if there's, if you need a separate ROI for that. Not really, because um, the person knows that that provider's signing their plan, their person or their legal rep knows that they're signing their plan. And your role is to, make sure the services work out for that person. Um, but I can imagine that sometimes it might be just easier to sign it if you're working with a particular agency and that's what they want done. Uh, I don't really have any specific situation in mind, um, but that is a good resource there for you. So that's about it. Okay, well, I'm gonna pull over the Academy. So pulling over my web browser so that you can see where this course is. It's this course right here with the fireweed in the background under documentation. So this is really a great tool for you to take. It's an open enrollment. You can tell it's open enrollment because of the little arrow over here. That means you don't have to contact us to enroll in the class. You can just click it and begin the course. So we wanted to make sure you were queued up on that. If I was looking for the regulation on documentation, where, what would I be looking for? Is it in the home and community based regs or is it in the provider regs? Do you want me to answer? <laughs> yeah, or our care okay. coordinators could answer. Does anybody know? That's like the hot, the, the quiz question, I guess. Where are our documentation requirements as Medicaid providers? I see a question about taking that training. If it doesn't, if it gets a certificate, does it have a CEH? Well, it's not labeled as a CEH in um, in the academy, so there, it's not going to count as that coming straight out of the academy. Um, for our conditions of participation, if your agency, you know, documents it as a CEH, 
according to the requirements and care coordinator conditions of participation, it could possibly be included as a CEH for you. But, you know, that's as it is with all of your in-house trainings or in-services and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. I wanted to try to answer the question. Um, so just within the regulations, the state regulations, the statutes, is that where the documentation requirements would be found? Well, if we look under our 105 series, which is like Medicaid provider um, requirements, it should be there. We can go take a look. Okay. If people are interested in it, we have the time to do that. So let's go take a look. So when I'm looking for regs, you can go about it two ways. You can go directly from our site or you can go to the Alaska State Legislature. Look at that. So going to there, this main page, and I actually know we want to go to the 105 series. So that's under Medicaid 7A C 105. And once we're in this section, I can go to the table of contents and kind of get a check of like the overall. And I don't I don't know this off the top of my head, guys. I'm just looking at it because we're talking about it and I want you to kind of explore it yourself. You can check, you know, let's see. It's 230 right provider records. There we go. So let's click on it and take a look. So this is the nitty gritty. This is what, these are the, the sufficiency standards that we look for for documentation. The person receiving the treatment, the service being, and remember this is for like all kinds of Medicaid providers. So it does have a more medical orientation, but thinking about in the context, this is universal. Everybody should be doing the same sort of documentation, a standard, if you will. So what's, who's the person? What's being, what service is being provided? The extent of each service, so like how much? The date on which each service was provided? and the individual that provided the service. And then we have, you know, the records that the provider has to keep track of for financial information. And so this is like a really good, at a minimum, this is where you really wanna make sure your notations keep track of these five pieces. And then when you go into the documentation basics training, you can learn more about um, different strategies for that and practices that you can use to implement for your um, work. So any other questions or thoughts we wanted to kind of dig into on this? There's a comment, I guess, from Abby about the training, not going into details on how to write goals and objectives, if you wanted to address that. So this is a work in progress okay. for us for training. Um, we're develop always developing training. Um, it's in our LMS, our, our yearly goal for 2024 is to build up our training. So it's a work in progress, something separate for care coordinators about writing goals and objectives. Um, it does have info about documenting to goals and objectives as it is a documentation training. So it's, we're hoping it's helpful for people who are working from goals and objectives in an approved plan. That was the intent of it. A um, couple of questions, uh, recent Myers and Stauffer's audits, new recommendations for documentation. Okay, so Myers and Stauffer's audits are for the past. So I don't know about that being new. I'm not sure you know, how to understand that. Um, the audit questions are interesting. We can always teach to regulation. We invite you to come to our office hours if you have this type of question or to email us and let us know, you know, with the nature of that. Um, we're happy to help explain what, what was required in regs at that time or is 
required in regs at the present time. Um, we're not able to consult or advise about specific situations with Myerson Stauffer audits as it is outside of our role. Um, but we're happy to take on individual, you know, queries and to provide the regulatory info that that's that you need. Thanks for that. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and minimize the screen here and take us to the reminders section. So when we're looking at what's on the horizon, pretty big one with the the flexibilities ending on June 30th. We're finding that um, some folks have had the experience where it's been extended again and again and again. So we're all a little bit, you know, wondering like, is it gonna get extended? We are very, very confident it will not. Um, that being said, there's always like a wild situation that could occur, but please please plan on the PHE flexibilities ending in the next few weeks. Prepare for regulations to go into effect and prepare for flexibilities to end. Cat dropped in the, uh, the most recent PHE um, that was um, FAQ that was Updated and sent by eAlert, it was accompanied by a memo that acknowledged that some of the pieces that are in play right now don't necessarily have regulation sets included with them. And there's a memo giving, identifying which of those services are included in that and the best practice for that time. We've also encountered an uptick in questions about legally responsible individuals as paid providers and you know what's allowed after the pandemic PHE flexibilities ending. So I have for you a really quick and easy read document that explains who is considered a legally responsible individual and then which services are they allowed to deliver after June 30th? And it includes community first choice personal care services, home and community-based waiver service of supported living, and home and community-based waiver service of in-home supports. Those are the three services where that is allowed for a legally responsible individual to deliver. There is an exception, and that's if a, a court decree has been um, has been created and um, authorized by a court, a tribal system, a court system, and you can ask about court decrees from a saga, and we have a link for them as well. So I'm going to drop this resource into the chat as well. If you encounter families or providers that are unsure of what exactly is coming down. It really is intended to be a conversation tool to help people understand what practices will be, um, what services where it'll be allowed. And if you have questions on how to pursue getting a court decree, we can give you warning handoffs to a saga, but they're really the best resource to support navigating that process. So there's a question in the chat, and I've gotten a number of emails about parents of minor children getting guardianship. And I don't know that it's possible. I've seen one. We have uh, we have seen one instance where parents, when it was through tribal courts, when parents of a minor child went through a tribal court and got a document that it's a guardianship document that says that they can be a paid provider. I don't know if non-tribal courts would be doing that. I I suggest going through a saga for that kind of guidance, maybe, and information. But we have we've seen it was a couple of months ago, and it was one instance where we've seen that. And I've gotten a number of questions from providers and care coordinators about that. So sorry, I don't have a better answer. I I don't know if the courts. We don't know if the courts would approve that. Um, 
that's really something that the families can explore with the court system. Uh, they can reach out to Osaga. And those folks are really nice, super helpful. Uh, I've gotten all, only positive feedback from anybody who's worked with them on guardianship or, or you know, custody, things like that. So I, sorry, we don't have a better answer. And for those kind of asking about what does the court decree have to say, we have seen guardianship documents that say uh, all waiver services. We have seen guardianship documents say specific waiver services. Um, some of the documents I've seen say waiver and PCS. So it really depends on what the intent of the document is. But it's up to the court to right. They 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 can decide. They can they know about it. They're the ones that decide what to write. The family and people involved, they just need to tell their story and the court will decide for them. Question says, uh, is there a reason why legal was removed from regulation and just stating representative? Does it allow for more flexibility on who you can contact if the guardian agrees to let someone else be the representative for care coordination visits? Um, you know, nothing has really changed. It's, it, it is contact, uh, sorry, it is a person's representative, could be somebody they delegate, could be a POA, something like that. It could be somebody that a, a legal guardian designates to, you know, act on their behalf while they're unavailable, that type of thing. It, it is not for the reason of care coordinator contacts to be different people other than what regulation states. It's for for the reason of the person and their legal rep per that situation, whether it's a POA that I delegate or whether like I'm a guardian and I'm gonna go out of town and I have somebody else act on my behalf, that type of thing. So that's a paper trail, you know, if you contact somebody and it's because the guardian was unavailable and they put somebody else in place, and that's a paper trail if it's a POA, which is a regular paper tra paper trail that we're, you know, accustomed to. A uh, question about natural parents are, parents are guardians without a decree, so there's nothing to update or add to. Um, I think, Delight, you stated that, or Kat, we talked about, um, about natural parents and having to court decrees and we have not seen that very much. We can't really speak to that. There isn't really any, the stance here is like, there's nothing that SDS or our regulations say or do that make it so you can tell a court what to do with a person as far as this, you know, situation goes. They can tell a court what they need and the court can decide what to do. We, that's my best answer really, haven't gone through much of this, um, and talked about it with a lot of different people. The example that was given was like a tribal court. I have one example that I know of from all my years in this work too, which is where it was a foster parent and the, they really had nobody else available to do the work. But I can't make the inference that it's always that way and only for foster parents. The only best guidance I can give you is like, it's a bigger bucket than that. The court needs to decide what to do per the person's needs, not the other way around or for services convenience type of thing. It's for the person, the person's needs. Um, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Um, why remove legal then? You know, I really don't know that our, all of our regs go through a regulatory review and the, the regulation writers write that stuff. Um, there's, you know, it's more inclusive, but the, the, the language is more inclusive, but the need does not umbrella out to everybody under the sun that, you know, is around the person. Um, okay, when app K ends, new care coordination regulations should come into play with face-to-face -face visits required at least every six months with at least one home visit per year. Yes, they're in effect July 1, okay. All right, just reading. 
Yeah, that, and the, there was a little story in here, which is great about guardianship orders for a family member to be a paid provider. This is fairly common, you know, it depends on people's resources. This is where the court understands what's going on with that person and they make the decision. It's a good example of that. We have a All right. Raised. Okay, go ahead. Was that me? <laughs> yeah, go uh, ahead, Denise. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just asking. Um, well, I, I'm just kind of saying that we had a meeting this morning with the AADD, and um, Rebecca um, talked about uh, just a really awesome idea. And I think it opens the door with this word with, uh, with removing legal, that in many situations in OCS, at least, um, there are individual representatives that represent that client, like the foster parents who sign them up for school, who take them to doctor's appointments, who do things for them and know things for them um, that aren't having to go through a guardian. And so um, there are like proxy um, uh, agreements made. And we are wondering if there's a way to talk about proxy agreements with OPA um, for different individuals that, because um, sometimes OPA doesn't even know these people um, very well, you know, with their large caseloads, that when we make contact, um, we can talk with um, other folks um, about them uh, in replacing that legal part um, through that pro a proxy agreement and wondering if that's something worth discussing. Um, so I, I think it just makes things yeah. more flexible. I get it. I'm I'm not prepared to say yes or no right now today on that. I'd have to ask. I'd have to look into it. The trainer in me says that regulations say what they say. And, you know, then you have to make this loop. And then we get the questions around audits and things like that. I get it. Right now it says representative that's their representative. It is not to be interpreted as, you know, anybody, anyone says who has knowledge of this person. We don't have definitions around that right now today. I mean, we can certainly look into it. You know, I get the need. I understand it. Well, um, what you're having right now is pushback because mm -hmm. we have OPA basically saying, well, in order to bill, you have to talk to me, but you know, you can also go see the client twice. And so they're mm -hmm. kind of pushing back on a lot of this um, with, um, some of the light language, you know, used of, you know, not basically saying we have to contact them at all. Um, you know, they're not super excited about making any phone calls with us. So this mm -hmm. would be a win-win for us, a win-win for them. Uh, they mm -hmm. still make the decisions on plan of care changes. They're still part of the plan of care meeting. They're still part of the team. They can be emailed information, but this mm -hmm. would allow us to really talk with the people that are actually doing it. And with the removal of legal, it does it does open the door for that. So um, maybe we can move up the chain and talk about this a little bit, um, because mm -hmm. I don't think it can be answered in just one, you know, sitting here by anybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think uh, because there are proxies in place for uh, foster care providers to um, take kids to the doctor and do other things that are representing that client who probably know a lot more about what's going on with that client than the guardian anyway. Mm -hmm. So I hear definitely what you're saying. I think the best course of action at this time is, a, I'm just going to say it plain, really follow the red face test rule. When you make that contact, are you connecting with the person and their, the people that are constantly around them? Are you able to monitor if services are being delivered? Are you able to document that? So are you able to touch base? I mean, like via phone call, connect with that family and make sure services are being delivered as far as care coordination go. I think that's a really important element here is that we're trying to ensure safety of the person and that we're trying to ensure that services are being delivered. I understand, you know, the big change here is really the biggest change of all is that email correspondence and text is no longer on the table as a contact because we've removed this requirement of monthly physical contact. So now that that's been removed and it's more open, we do still need everyone that has a waiver has institutional level of care and the role of the care coordinator is to monitor that service delivery and ensure their safety. So as a provider, 
um, do what you have to do to make sure that that happens. You know, if contacting OPA is not meeting that need for you because they don't know who the person is, they don't, they do, they're not timely responding. I wouldn't consider for this caseload that would be the best person to contact to monitor delivery of services. So it's really case specific. It may be that when you're working with a family, the foster family, the foster parent is the best person to establish that, that role of checking with that person. That being said, we hear what you're saying about the question about legal, we can talk about it, but I really just want to re-emphasize the goal of contacts is to make sure the person is safe and that their services are being delivered according to plan and that it's about that person. So thinking on those kind of components, be mindful about that and be selective if, you know, there are many people that are guardians that aren't even in state that aren't in that kind of connective role. And it is, it's going to be more effective to directly see the person to be able to ensure that the continuity of care and the quality of care is there. Okay. So always coming back to what's the point of this service? Why is it a billable service? The point is that we check on the person. Okay, so let's focus on that for now and we can take your feedback um, and work with policy team to figure out, you know, some clear direction on that so that we can clarify that for you. I think we can move on to the reminders of our resources now. So we have a couple of reminders about resources. We have the office hours, which you guys have been coming to. But if you haven't, come and see us. So Thursdays, 8 to 9 a.m. for care coordinators. And then Thursdays, 3 to 4. So for all providers, the care coordinators are welcome to come. And if you have specific questions about specific cases, just want to chat, uh, come and see us. Uh, the other is the, like I said, provider office hours are three to four, also on Zoom. And we've had actually care providers and providers come together on the same case. And that worked out really well because we're able to talk to everybody um, about the same topic and get everybody on the same page. And we also have the family and individual office hours, which are every first and third Wednesday, uh, sorry, Monday of the month. We had one yesterday, right? Yesterday. yesterday. Uh, and those are during lunch hour, and then that's for you know people who are currently on the waiver or maybe are interested uh, to know more about the waiver. So it's really for anybody who wants to talk to us. You know, they could come with a provider, they could come on their own. It's really up to them. It's just we just want to make sure we're available to to answer questions or uh, troubleshoot with them. And then the other resources we have the usual the training. Uh, the SDS training YouTube channel, the policy unit YouTube channel. And you guys got an e-alert today about the NRI training being available on YouTube. Uh, and we already talked about the light, the training academy. I don't know if you guys want to talk about any other trainings that are coming up that we're working on right now, but those trainings change sometimes week to week, and we don't always send out a notification about that. So keep checking our learning academy just to see what we have posted because we're always working on new things. I don't know if you guys wanted to talk about kind of more working on, but Kara already talked about the documentation training. Like she said, it's a work in progress. Um, so we could always revise the trainings we have. Not every training is going to be a CEH training. Some trainings are just trainings. <laughs> Not everything is going to produce uh, a credit for you for, for research. So I don't know if you wanted to add something, Kara. No, you're right. I'm hoping that it becomes a, a good resource for everybody. There's a new course in there. It's not really a course. It's a document library. We frequently get asked to uh, send out the care coordinator resource guide, the training guide, if you will, and other documents. There's some easy read documents in there about waiver processes that might help if you end up, you know, talking with somebody who's new to the new to the process of having a waiver or getting one or applying. 
Uh, we are working on an even easier, easy to read one for that. Um, and it takes quite a while. So just keep your eyes out. We have it, we're working on a training about restrictive interventions for our providers and for care coordinators. Um, and one about plain language, which will be a CEH for you. And uh, yeah, those are the, the biggest ones I can think of right now. Of course, we have work in progress about habilita hab uh, habilitation goals and objectives and some best practices around that. So there's a lot of uh, messages in our chat, which is which are pretty situational. Um, if you have questions regarding visits and things like that, I think you should consider emailing them to us. It looks like there's sort of individual stories about specific clients. Um, yeah, we we have done a lot to uh, to get the word out about upcoming changes. Um, if you have questions. We recommend you come to our office hour or just email us a question. You could email cat at the care coordination liaison address or SDS training at alaska.gov. It'll give us some time to sort of vet it and research it and get the right info out to you. Um, but thanks so much for participating and, and writing them down here too. We still have some time. That doesn't mean we have to use it because the CH, right, Kara, is a CH. <laughs> right. It's okay. So. We'll give you an hour if we do end end early. It's been over half right now. So I'm not, you know, we don't count them down to the the second here. I know that we're equivalent to an hour. Plus, we'll send out your email as always that says keep this email for one hour CEH and we want you to keep it because we don't send out separate certificates for these. And then um, you can also refer to the recording so you can review it later. And Jeannie, you could ask questions and you've asked questions and others have too and we've answered them pretty sure. It may not be the answer you want or you were looking for, but the guidance regarding contacts hasn't changed. The regulations are out. There's nothing at this time that we can do to tell you something different than what we have been communicating. And that's what's been in the FAQs as well. So if you have specific questions about a specific case, this is not a great forum for it. So maybe, you know, shoot us an email. We could set up a time to meet or come to our office hours and we could you know, discuss specific cases. Um, but we have done a lot of communicating about the changes it's not been well received and we get that, we're, we get that. Uh, but the, the guidance hasn't changed. So I'm not, I'm not sure we could keep talking about it, but the guidance hasn't changed. And we're, we won't be able to tell you anything different. So, and uh, Heidi, you have your hand up, go ahead. Hey, um, so this is just a question, not, I'm just thinking outside the box here, since this seems to be like an issue that is uh, concerning to everybody, um, would the state ever consider maybe modifying the COPS to include written documentation again? That's one question. And the only reason why I'm asking that is because when I was recently audited by Myers and Stauffer, they said, if there's any other additional documentation, emails, handwritten notes, anything like that, please submit that to us. So I did in several of the cases and they accepted it. So I guess that's just a little point of, I guess, confusion maybe on my part or a little inconsistency. So I, I would it be moving mountains to, to get that into the regulation because it is such a pain in the butt to reach out to OPA, but it's just an idea, just a question. So this is Kara. Um, of course, our conditions of participation have changed over the years, and of course, it's possible to change them. And because they're referenced in law, it happens the same way laws do. They propose a change or a change time. There's a comment period. We collect the comments, and then we decide what we can do per regulation, and then 
the commissioner signs off and they get issued. In general, it's usually easier to change the conditions of participation rather than regs just because of all of the regs that are out there that are on people's desks. So if you have a suggestion for conditions of participation change, the right place to send that would be to our policy inbox. And I don't have it handy right now today, but I'll put it in the chat. The I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in the chat in a second. Okay. Policy is the one that um, you know, starts those processes. So, and it's always been that way um, since we've had conditions of participation, which long time ago now replaced a care coordinator standards document that we had, which was confusing and not in reg and not clear. Um, yeah, we, of course we can do that. That's what we want to have happen. We wanna have regs work and conditions of participation work for people. Um, Yeah. And thanks, Kat. You know, the, into the questions coming in about visits and things like that, there isn't really anything new that we have to state to that except to process through your individual situation. So that's why we're saying to email us or, you know, come to an office hour so that we have the chance to interact with you and st fully discuss what you're facing. Thanks, Kat, for the email address. So Lane's asking, uh, we used to be required to give clients a client satisfaction survey. Is that still required? And I see Denise answered it, but there's two there's two threads here that can get confusing. So I wanna make sure they're untangled. We have the plan questionnaire that is asking those basic questions of, did you meet your care coordinator? Are your services being delivered according to plan? If they didn't go according to plan, what's going on with that? And that's required for submission for your support plan. So that's one questionnaire. You are required as an agency to also have customer, essentially like a, a satisfaction survey and collect data on your services as a provider. So there's two separate thoughts there. You have your agency questionnaire that you give your clients to find out you know, if they're satisfied with your service delivery and have ways to give you feedback that allows for them to be free and gab in providing feedback. And then we also have the plan questionnaire. So we want to make sure that's really clear, two separate ideas. Well, I don't have anything else on my end to offer. Um, we can keep the channel open for a little bit longer and then we can wrap up and let you enjoy your, um, if you're in the Anchorage area, sunny afternoon. I, I don't have an answer for you, Christine, on the financial question uh, about how the money is going to be used. We haven't heard anything about that. Sorry. So here's an interesting question. Can an agency which provides waiver habilitation service choose to use a consumer-directed PCA model when providing services. I am not sure what that exactly is asking. What about the waiver HAB service is being filtered through consumer-directed PCA model? What is it specifically? You could write it or say it.
I mean, I can tell you off the top I'll, of my head, I'll, it's different. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's sorry, okay. Go ahead. I'll okay. tell you what it means for this uh -huh. individual that they're, they're, they're depending on the power of attorney to do all the hiring, firing, supervision, training. Um, they don't respond when they don't provide any staff for that person. They don't do anything as far as helping them find staff. Um, and when I object, I'm, I'm being told that there are, that the client signed um, a contract um, indicating that um, they are aware that that they're running this program now as a consumer directed like a consumer directed program, and that they only have the only responsibility they have is to um, check in with them on a quarterly basis. So I've been trying to get this client staffed who's high risk at falls. And they're not assisting with setting up a schedule or um, or trying okay. to find staff, that kind of thing, and leaving it so, all the power of attorney. Are you sure this is a HAB service the person has? I know that's absolutely. a dumb question, and I apologize. Okay. No, absolutely. And I can forward yeah. you the messages. I did send in yeah. something, something to QA, but I was told. Um, well, so that's good. Yeah. So, um, but it's. It's okay. The statewide provider, so it's very worrisome for me. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, from I mean, we can talk about it. At, this will be great for office hours because then we can look it up and all that. You know, we could spend okay. some more time with it. But for the general audience, that is not what HAB services have around them as a a structure. It's consumer directed PCA. Um. The agency. I don't to know about you guys, but have. my audio cut out for Kara. Oh no, it was working. Okay, it was working. Can you hear me, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See you in the light. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, the 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 agency should okay. be following the the habilitation services conditions of participation for that for a habilitative service. Yes. You know that's not that is not. Just because they're maybe they provide consumer directed PCA, right? I get that. Right. Just because they do that doesn't mean that they get to apply that to every single service they do. They need to. They're they they promised that they would be doing have services through their certification. We approved it, and it seems mm -hmm. like they're not doing it. So I would report it as a quality assurance report. This is just me talking. Like, what would I do? Um, no. You and I could also report it as health and safety risk to the person. I know you said fall risk, but I'm not really thinking about HAB services for that. That's right. more. She is on an IED I mean? waiver because of a seizure disorder and okay. just some other things. So yes, definitely. So, and so she's got, you know, a seizure disorder. So that's one of the factors that she, when she's alone, she has a seizure, you know, um, and then has multiple multiple falls which have which has resulted in accidents so my thing is is that um you know there just it, there just doesn't seem to be any mm -hmm. um, concern about staffing her or making sure that the services are provided as i mean well she, she was you give your life. person choices too i don't know what's going on in the area like if there are any choices but if the person wants to go with a different agency or something I oh don't know. i understand that but it, this is something that they're that this, they switched to this model and that's how they're providing all their services to all their, their habilitative clients. Um, so I, I'm just going to continue to follow up because I read the conditions of participation. I've worked in this field long enough. I know what the responsibilities are. Um, yeah. I've worked in agencies and this is make, you know, this is to me, it's. Mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah. It's, well, if you want to stop by our, our care coordinator hour or even our provider hour, if you have time, if you don't have time, you could always email. If it's a particular person, you can uh, let us know what the Harmony ID is. We can, okay, you know, process it a little, a little bit more. Um, okay. But the way you're saying it doesn't sound right to me at all. Like, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's right to yeah. deliver something as a different service, and you're signed up, and you know. Yeah, for, for the HAB stuff. Yeah, I'll, is it okay? Can can I forward you the email that they sent me that defined if, that? If it has no p, if it has no PHI, if it has PHI, okay. just redact that, or you okay. can send it to me DSM if you want. But okay, you can send it to us regular if it doesn't have PHI. But no, how many ID numbers are okay? You can send okay. us those. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Good question.
Okay. Um, I am not seeing new questions here. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we've been able to give you some good reminders, um, some information, uh, general info. I'm going to go ahead and call this session to a close. And we'll email you, give us a little bit of time because it takes a, it takes a little while for our video to cook before we get it up. And we will on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for notifications when we add new videos. And um, yeah, and our, our reminders will be here with the attachments in your email that will say, keep this email in the uh, the subject line. So you can always look back for it later. Not a separate certificate, just an email. If you want to keep a copy of that email on file for your one hour CEH. Um, okay, great. Thanks team for all this information. Um, and for our care coordinator community, thank you for what you do and your great questions and thoughts um, around our ever-changing set of circumstances and duties. Um, and we'll catch up with you next month in this particular forum, but hopefully before then in our uh, care coordinator office hour or perhaps our provider office hour. Okay, we sure will. We'll put in the agenda and the other attachments that we uh, that we put into the chat here. All right, take care, everybody, and we'll see you very soon. Thanks Thank you. again. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.